Thank you. I acknowledge that we're on the land of the Wurren, the Wurren Jarrow people, and that they are the custodians of this country. I also say Assalamu alaikum. I also say from the Maori people where I've learnt to say this in, in New Zealand, Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Tena Koto Katawa, which means welcome everybody. Thank you very much for this invite to site and everybody here. Today I will talk about the most important demand placed upon education. As you know, there have been some monstrosities in New Zealand of late, and that will be a key topic of what I'm going to talk about. But it's important to understand it's not just in New Zealand. This happens across the whole world. So it's an important topic for our school children, for our adults and our grandparents and our communities. I'm going to tell three stories. I'm going to talk about Norway and New Zealand, both the old and the new. I'm going to talk about the most important demand placed on all education. And I'm going to go back to the time of Germany in the 1960s. I'm also going to talk about something called resentiment, which isn't quite the same as resentment. I'll give it a special uh, meaning. And I'm going to talk about moral education, of course. So, so to talk about stories, some might say that's not the way to talk about scientific things. Some might say that's not what professors talk about and that we should talk about science. But there has been a big move for many years now to, cons to consider stories as a form of science or to even consider science as nothing more than a story. And I do like this quote here about saying that time only becomes human when it becomes like a narrative or a story. And narratives, in turn, only become meaningful when they're organized in the form of a story. The classic understanding of a story is a beginning, a middle, an end with a plot. And that can mean the story of a, a society, a culture, a religion, or an individual. For me, I always think of stories as based upon growing from the individual. And I'm always mindful of my mother-in-law who always started her stories in the middle. Never at the beginning. And you were immediately trying to work out why am I listening to this story? And it was her way of engaging the listener. And I think that's important to understand. Stories sometimes start in the middle and we go backwards. Sometimes stories have many points of origin. Sometimes they never finish. But for me, I think that's a way of connecting with our culture, our society, and also with science. For me, they can be valid knowledge. So the first story is about Norway and New Zealand. In many senses, on the opposite sides of the world, literally. Population small compared to Australia and many other countries in the world, only about five million people. They share many similarities. Mountains, snow, wind, forestry, they love milk products, which they export everywhere. Fish, of course, and oil and gas. In Norway, they've been taking their gas out for at least 40 or 50 years. And in New Zealand, they haven't yet made the final decision to start doing that. What characterizes them both is a colonial history. Norway was colonized by the Danish for 300 years, and then by the Swedish, their neighbors, for 100 years. And they have also colonized the Sami people, which are your, their first people, who have lived with reindeer and fishing for thousands of years. The image here is a very old tradition of drying cod. And then they've exported that first to Europe, then to South America to something called bakola. I don't know if the Arabic people eat bakola. I'm looking at Mohammed, who's saying, yes, they do. Um, Um, if we go to New Zealand as well, they've also been colonized by the white people, as they call them, Pakeha. Um, and they have that colonial history still there. What makes them special is that they have lived both as colonizing nations and have been colonized. Generally, the white people have colonized, and the others have had to put up with that. 
That's the old Norway and the old New Zealand. Very quiet places, often seen in the, the world landscape, trying to broker peace between different nations. It's always the smaller countries that have no special interests. It's not like the Australians who want to be own part of the world, the Pacific, and you could say not part of Europe where they all want to own each other. So what happens if we follow the story? Things all change. On the 22nd of July 2011, a Friday, a white Norwegian in his late 20s, uh, first he tries to blow up the Prime Minister's building, um, and then he jumps in his van and he drives to an island. This is summertime. In Norway, that's the big time for relaxing from the winter. And he dresses as a policeman, drives across to an island on which the Labour Youth Group have their annual um, call it, gathering for several days. And he then proceeds to execute uh, 69 people. Eight people were killed in the bomb when he tried to blow up the Prime Minister's big building. The Prime Minister, Jens Stoltenberg, shortly afterwards said the following, that it was not, there were en Norge før, or no other en an etter 22. juli. Before, nor, before, we had one Norway. Now we have a different one. It was a country that had lived very quietly. No security. You could drive up to the Prime Minister's building in your van, full of bombs, and just leave it there. You couldn't do that anywhere else in the world. But they grew up. It changed. It was a new time. And I call this monumental time in the sense that every nation has those monumental events when the whole culture changes. We fast forward. 15th of March. That was also a Friday. Friday prayer. In a small, somewhat sleepy town called Christchurch, in the southern part of New Zealand. A white person, not actually a New Zealander, an Australian, uh, then proceeds to massacre people attending Friday prayer. 50 died on that day and one passed one year later, uh, one, a little later. When it happened in Norway on the Saturday, you could walk around any city in Norway and it was totally quiet. There was a silence. When it happened in New Zealand, there was an outpouring of um, grief, of the need to embrace the people who lived there who were of Islamic faith. The Prime Minister, in her first speech to Parliament, said the following, he will, meaning the person who was the perpetrator, when I speak, shall be nameless. There was a, a public silence on mentioning his name. He will not be gratified by knowing that he has gained attention. So I mention these, these two stories, two small countries, and the way time changed. And of course what happened, people were worried about their children. Do you tell children about what's happening? It was the same thing that happened in Norway. I used to live in Norway for many years at this time. And the same thing happened in New Zealand. What should we tell our children? The most normal reaction in, I call it, Western white society is to run for the psychologists. You find them on the radios, you find them in the communities, everywhere, not just in Christchurch. It's always struck me, I used to work a lot with refugees, and refugees coming from Africa or other parts of the world were not accustomed to running to psychologists. The whole idea of post-traumatic stress that they were told they were all going to feel was something they resolved as a community, as a religious group, as a group of people. And I still think that's fundamental. What we saw in Norway and New Zealand was in a way a collective way of trying to work this out. Not to deny the role of psychologists at all, but to say there are many ways of working through what happens in these monumental events. So I've talked about what happened. So how can we understand that? And for this, I'm going back to 
uh, a radio talk by a German Jew called Theodor Adorno. And he said in the very first sentence, very simply, the most important demand placed upon all education is that Auschwitz does not happen again. And since then, from 66 to today, we've had equivalent examples of that. We now have massacres that happen not in just two countries, but throughout the whole world, in areas in war, in peace. What Adorno tries to do is to say, well, can we actually understand why this happened? And the talk given yesterday from our colleague from Singapore, uh, who came from Malaysia, talked a lot about sociology. And Adorno, he said, well, sociology is important. It helps us understand the society. But we really need to look at many different causes. For the Germans, why did they follow Hitler? It was the humiliation of losing the war. It was the humiliation of an economy and a politics which was not able to change their future. And Adorno's point was, it's hard to change societies. It's hard to legislate peace. It's hard to legislate economies that are fair and just to everybody. Maybe we can change personalities, was his point. So he looked and he said, in Germany, the fathers, the grandfathers, the heads of households, male and female, they couldn't help people in the 1930s in Germany. It was a time when they looked to strong leaders. What did Hitler do? He educated people to be hard, to lack empathy, to treat others as objects. He looked at the people who con committed terrible atrocities in prison camps, and he made the rather unfair comment, everybody who grew up in a village was always very hard and lacked empathy because they killed pigs and cows and different animals, which of course is not fair. But his point was that we can educate to hardness, or we can educate to justice. These are the really important tasks. Children must be educated to independent thought, he said, so they don't simply follow the strong leaders or the people who are making incorrect decisions. And he said, what's really important as a people, as a religious group, as a community, that we raise awareness on a continual fashion about the conditions that support such monstrosities. In Norway, there's a famous author who's not an academic, but writes very important books called Orsna Seashta. I was actually taught by her father, totally random, and he refused to drive. He had one brother who was a bishop, one who was a communist, and he was an academic. And his daughter, she kind of learned all of these different things. And she's written a book about the Norwegian who committed the atrocities in Norway looking at his childhood. He was rejected by his father. He grew up with his mother. Even in his early school days, he was the kind of kid who would have been picked up nowadays as having immense problems. There was something wrong with him. He, was not, he had no friends as a teenager. In his 20s, he found his friends on the dark side of the web. He lived a mixture of rage. For him, it was the Labour Party who had let in all the migrants. And self-pity. Poor me. He wrote a giant manifesto which was basically clip and paste. It wasn't all his own words. He never wrote 1,500 pages. And he published it. This is what he wanted to be remembered for. He craved attention. The person who committed the atrocities in New Zealand also published a manifesto, also craved to be seen, to be talked about. And that's why Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister, refused to mention his name. 
for several weeks, nobody saw pictures of them. The media were forbidden to cover it. Jacinda had the point, she said, about the Islamic people, you are part of us. Sejdar's book was even worse because the person who committed the atrocities was one of the Norwegians. The point I'm making is to understand why people do these things is as important to understand what happened. It's important to think it is about politics, it is about culture, it is about individuals. It is about their childhoods, which is central to schooling, about education. It is, as Adorno said, the most important task in education is making sure that we understand how to bring people up to create empathy, to understand others, not to be hard. And we can see in these two stories of these two um, terrible people that the mixture of rage and self-pity was bathed in their loneliness. They weren't part of communities. And in my time working with SIGHT and their fantastic members, what I've also learned is the debates they are involved in are also about making sure education does not create the conditions for such atrocities. So the last story is about resentment. And as said, that's not the resentment as we normally think of it. I will give it a special meaning. It's moving from the first story saying what happened, two stories. Moving from the second story, which was, well, how can we understand why it happened and what must be the most important task of education? To the third story, which is, what ought we be doing in education? It's to move from the is to what must be done. This story is nothing to do with the topic here, but it says in the little bubble there, knowledge is power. It's the very traditional form of education where the teacher knows everything and the poor frightened student is there writing up the answer, perhaps right or wrong, on the blackboard. And Norwegians were very happy on this particular case because they were now the best at mathematics in the Nordic countries, better than the Finnish people and the Swedes and the Norwegians, uh, the Danish who'd colonised them. Three perspectives on what should we be doing. I've had a dialogue with Mohammed over several weeks, months, about what is the key in Islamic culture. I pr pretend not to be any expert. And Mohammed, being Mohammed, sends me a fantastic quote back, and I'll try and say this, Tabia, or Tabia? I don't know the pronunciation. But as being the central tenet of education in the Islamic faith, about the person, the whole person, developing themselves, growing, becoming noble, not in an arrogant fashion, but understanding their tasks in society and culture. One of the things I have learned from Mohammed is how connected all cultures are. How connected and important the Greek culture is for all civilizations. And Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do, central to Islamic faith, central to all forms of schooling that repeating until we learn things. What does it look like in different cultures? Sorry, one more slide um, before I get to the other perspective. This is a lovely piece of calligraphy which I came across a few months ago. Somewhere embedded in there is the Arabic for science is a torch which illuminates the world. The view that Islamic culture is also concerned with science. Science and culture, religion, art, they are all part of those stories we tell. They are all part of holding those things we value, the things we me measure ourselves by, by the stories we tell. There is no one or the other. 
What's it like in different cultures? If we go to the Nordic countries, they have a word, donelse, translated in English very clumsily, to build on, to make oneself a picture of what one would like to be. For the Nordic countries, they talk about lifelong learning. They talk about how you gradually learn a culture, and that's the point of education. You learn those values over time. Ellen Key was a famous Swedish early childhood educator who said this lovely word or phrase. The formation of the person, Bildung, is what remains after we've forgotten every single thing we learned. A paradox. You go to school to learn things, to remember things. Her point, what you learn, is not necessarily the curriculum. And my apologies to the president of the Curriculum Association who's here with us. Um, it's not necessarily the knowledge you learn, but it's what are those values it's packed in. And it's always intrigued me, the discussion we have today, we call them 21st century skills. They're not really 21st century skills, they've always been there. These are those so-called soft skills about being a human being, about being able to show empathy. The way we talk about it in universities is every graduate must learn how to work in a group, to be a leader, to take notes. Otherwise you won't get a job. They're your 21st century skills. My thinking now is in the Islamic culture, education is about building moral character. That is a very strong version of 21st century skills. Moral character is about recognizing others, about showing empathy, showing leadership when it's required in all things. Maori culture, which I'll turn to in a moment. In New Zealand, they also espouse these values. They don't call them 21st century skills. They don't call them anything special, but they are exactly what remains after they have forgotten everything they've learnt. It's based in what they call the marae, which is the communal meeting place traditionally. Very strict world, uh, rules of observance. Roles are very clearly defined to protect different people. So what is education for the Maori culture? It's about two special roles, tupuna and mokapuna. Tupuna is the grandparent. Mokapuna is the grandchild. For them, the word puna means a fountain or a spring. The grandparent is the spring of everything that has gone by. Puna for the grandchild is the spring or the fountain of everything to come. For them, it is a combination of those two, which is education. That is where they create meaning. The challenge for the Maori people, they've had a, a whole generation who were afraid to speak their own language and culture, the 70s and the 80s. They now have these people who are parents who cannot speak their own language. They know the culture. They have the challenge, which is also a challenge in all nations of the world, about the teenagers who do not want to acknowledge what has gone by, either faith, knowledge, parents, grandparents, and what to do. I was intrigued by the session I heard yesterday about the importance of acknowledging the Aboriginal language. And I agree. It is central. Language and culture are central. Dylan talked about how many people could say they could speak, or no, I think it was Mohammed talked about how many people could speak. No, it wasn't. It was Nadia talked about how many people can speak one or two or three languages. Not everybody speaks lots of languages, but they are central. And I've learned one thing very important in New Zealand culture. I've appointed uh, a person who's my cultural advisor. All key decisions that I make in my role 
she has to be present and give advice and also say how she thinks they should be made. She is not an academic or a professor, but she knows the Maori culture. I think the way of moving this forwards in the context of the Australian culture is it's hard to suddenly make all the Australian kids learn Aboriginal, but it would not be hard to have that advice from the local Maori elders taken seriously on boards within the schools. I don't believe that happens within the non-Islamic schools, but that would be a starting point. It doesn't necessarily work all the way in New Zealand. To the last thing, resentment. There's a famous play, Shakespeare's Hamlet. Hamlet is the son who believes his uncle has killed his mother, no, his father, and he wants revenge. And the whole play is about him thinking about it. Should he or should he not? Thinking about it, building up this feeling, this emotion of the need for revenge. And I'm mindful of some of the people I've talked about today who've committed atrocities. They've harbored these feelings for a long time. They have a view that the other is evil and they are good. That's their morality. It's called the mor morality of the slave. The morality of the ruler is often different. It's good and bad. The leader is good and everybody else can just be bad. They're not evil, they're just bad. The point of the idea of resentment is it's a form of re revenge or reaction that you cultivate in you. It makes you feel bad. It can make you feel ill. Whereas the other morality, the good and the bad, is not necessarily good either, but it's a spontaneous reaction. Knowing when to live out those times when things don't go your way. And I believe quite deeply that in education, children have to learn these lessons. When things don't go their way, there's a time and a place for reacting immediately. There's also a time and a place for waiting, for thinking about what's happened. And there is no either or. There are times when it is important to react and live out those feelings rather than let them burn and develop resentment. We look at children in kindergartens. They're learning these. We have to do this early. We look at classrooms. We have this topic called classroom management. In many ways, that's just about how do you manage these two moralities? To either react or when to be quiet and think about what you should be doing. So to summarize, For me, there are three stories. The story of what happens. And these atrocities happen far too often in different ways throughout the whole world. There's the story of why did they happen? It's not a simple, let's look at societies. It's not a simple, people aren't belonging to communities. It's not just the individual histories of individuals. The third story is about, well, what should we do? If we're interested in education, we should not want the conditions that propagate Auschwitz or massacres or atrocities. We have to work with children. And for me, I would sum it up in these three points. What are those moments of silence in Australia, in Islamic cultures, in all cultures, in Norway, it was the day after the monstrosity. There was silence, the whole country, everywhere. In New Zealand, it was the silence of the Prime Minister who said, I will not gratify, I will not give people attention for those terrible monstrosities. I will not name the person or persons. The second point is, in those moments of silence, they are those golden moments. They are those learning opportunities for adults 
parents and grandparents for children when we are receptive to making changes. And for me, the third point is knowing when to recognize the other as a learner. They can always learn. As a human being, not as an object. Recognizing those others and learning the point I finished with to understand what is resentment. When is it correct to react spontaneously? When is it correct not to? Thank you very much. <laughs>